Oregon football has won 22 straight games at Autzen Stadium. How big of an advantage is that as they look to make it 23 against the first top 10 opponent in Eugene since 2014? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view of the day if you're watching on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe wherever you're listening to or watching the show. Five-star views on Apple Podcasts. Those help as well. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And I'm pleased, as always, to be joined by Max Torres, whose camera is now in the locked and upright position and is uh, bouncing around just a, uh, a bit here. But we keep things rolling and such. He covers the Ducks for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated, and he hosts the Ducks Dish podcast. Max, I'm so excited for this football game, even though it may. Though the rumors are that it doesn't happen, it may rain at Autzen Stadium. Yeah, no, I'm I'm super stoked for this one, Spencer. I uh, appreciate you having me back on. Always fun to talk with you. Uh, as you were rolling through the intro, I realized I didn't have the right camera going for my uh, <laughs> my laptop. So uh, the one that comes with the laptop isn't isn't too great. So I had to try to improvise real quick. But yeah, man, it's gonna be a fun game without a doubt. Uh, midday game, which is gonna be nice because Oregon's. Had some pretty late kickoffs these past couple weeks, so I feel like uh, you know, kind of due for for an earlier kickoff, uh, you know, kind of enjoy the full day of college football. But man, can't wait for this game. It's it's going to be huge for Oregon, and uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a whole lot about it, and you know, kind of what a win would mean, and and just excited to dig into it. Yeah, I uh, would actually prefer an evening kickoff in this particular instance because Southern Utah has a home football game that I'm doing the play-by-play commentary for on ESPN Plus against Stephen F. Austin. It kicks off 30 minutes prior to the Duck game. So maybe I'll be catching the uh, the most exciting part. Hopefully the Ducks have got it in hand by then. But the biggest thing, Max, and this is from a mailbag question. You all know how to get a question answered here on the show at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks are the Twitter handles, DMs wide open, hop in the YouTube comments as well. The Brewing Pacific Northwestern PNW, it's written as Adventurer Asks, which is a great name. Hey, Spencer, first off, love the show. It's my first listen at work in the brewery every morning. That is a major W. First listen every day in the brewery. That is electric. How much do you think home field advantage will be a factor in this game? I haven't watched much UCLA this season. However, most of the big victories were at home. It appears as well as SC at Utah. Thanks again for the show and go Ducks. So I am big on Oregon this week. Now, the weather is is making me pause about whether or not they, they could win by you know 10 to 14 points or so. But UCLA has been really impressive. I said on Lockdown Pac-12, To this point in the season, they've been the best team in the Pac-12, or they're playing like the best team. But I'm still feeling good about Oregon here, even though there are a lot of challenges that UCLA presents. But the biggest thing that I don't think you can overlook is UCLA is 6-0. They've played five out of six games at home this year, Max. Five out of six. Their only road game was Colorado, which is a better road environment than you would probably think. But the product they're putting on the football field is one where they're big time celebrating after a win against Cal. And I think the home field advantage is the biggest reason why I am still confident in Oregon in this game. If this were neutral site or on the road, I would be much more skeptical. But because this is in Autzen Stadium where they've won 22 in a row, I, I like the Ducks. But, I mean, it's it's still going to be a tough game. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think you can overlook that. When you've played so many games at home and then you have to play your first real road test and it's this road test, it's asking a lot from the Bruins. Yeah, no doubt about it. And we talked about it a little bit on my show the other day, Spencer, depending on when uh, people are listening to this. But uh, the home field advantage is definitely going to be a factor for Oregon. It's not the only thing at play here, but we know that Oregon plays its best football at home. And to your point about UCLA, that almost reinforces kind of where I was at with this team earlier on in the season. They, they were undefeated, but they hadn't really played anybody. 
and then they get they get these two big wins over Washington and Utah, but both of those come at home. And then your only road game so far is against the doormat of the Pac-12. So in a similar way where I was kind of, you know, looking at that uh, Washington State game for Oregon a couple weeks back, we're still learning about this UCLA team. And this game at Oregon is going to kind of show us what parts of this team can travel. How solid of a team overall is this? How do they respond when they get punched in the mouth? And then there's, you know, 50 plus thousand screaming fans and a game day atmosphere all on top of that. Maybe a little bit of rain, but we know it doesn't rain. So it's, there's, there's a lot of different factors here that, that come into play. And we know uh, that, that Oregon is absolutely one of the toughest places to play, places to play in the Pac-12. And, um, you know, even though UCLA is undefeated, I think they still are figuring some things out. But, man, I'm not going to take anything away from them. This is a really solid team. And I think it's not a stretch to say they've kind of turned the corner here in these past two weeks, those big wins. It's by far the best team Chip Kelly has had. And that might have been true a year ago, because I think you could argue the weapons they had offensively were better than what they have this year, though Jake Bobo has been good. Last year, they had Greg Dulcich and Kyle Phillips and our guy Chase Cota, who is now thankfully a, a duck and you know maybe a little bit of a, of a revenge game here for him. I don't think he harbors a lot of ill will towards the Bruins, but there's always going to be that little edge of like, yeah, well, this is why I came here. And Playing this game in Austin Stadium, I think, is critical because what we saw last year in this game between UCLA and Oregon was the Ducks go down and get off to a terrible start, and the Rose Bowl doesn't exactly have the most electrifying environment for road teams to have to deal with, and so the Ducks, thankfully, were able to to rebound, go on a, I think, 34-3 to run, something like that. Like it was a big run after that 14 nothing start where the Ducks had a special teams gaffe and the offense wasn't moving the ball early. I feel like you could see the inverse of that in this game, right? Because both teams are coming off a bye. And so if you have that and that little bit of, of rust factor that's always going to be there, that favors the home team, right? When you have the ability to just pick up some momentum, get back into the flow of things with the support of the crowd behind you rather than them being against you, I think that's another reason that it, it's such a big boon for the Ducks to be playing this game inside Autzen Stadium. Yeah, anytime you have your, your home fans behind you, it's going to give you a, a little bit of a boost. And I think it's another opportunity to showcase that that atmosphere uh, that Autzen has to, to um, you know, provide for, for college football. Yeah, for everybody. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to showcase the school and just everything around it, especially with game day there. Um, and then Dan Lanning has talked a lot about, and the, so of the players, you know, I was listening to some of the press conferences earlier today before we recorded, they're talking about, you know, we're not going to deny how big of a game this is and, and all the other factors that are at play with game day and, you know, their record, they, they both haven't lost in Pac-12 play, but it seems like this team is really focused on just Oregon as the opponent every week. And um, I think it, I, can't, I think it was Jordan Riley that was talking about just kind of what the biggest changes have been since the beginning of the season since that georgia game and it kind of he was i'm paraphrasing here but it was really like their preparation has changed on such a drastic level from game one to game seven now uh that they're pre preparing for coming out of the bye week so definitely can't underestimate just i guess the value of a loss and i think it's it's just remarkable to watch how much this team has changed since that week one beat down um against Georgia and just a, a slight note I'm going to see if I can adjust my lighting a little bit because I this is this is not helping me too much right now and I thought I had it down <laughs> it's 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 a tricky tricky thing but uh another tricky thing that everyone has to deal with from time to time is sweating everybody sweats and if you have been like myself or many others and not wanted to wear those authentically cotton shirts that are going to showcase any little bit of sweat that you have to deal with. You need to check out sweat block and that is going to fix your sweating problem pronto. Sweat block was created by a doctor to help with his own excessive sweating It is doctor created and doctor doctor recommended. If you or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, try sweat block, save 20% with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com. Also available on Amazon as our, the uh, vast majority of things in the world. We continue here with Max Torres of the Ducks Dish podcast, covers Oregon for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. And Max, I, I talked a lot about UCLA on, on Tuesday, and I think that the Ducks have more things going for them than just the home field. But I do really believe 
that is the biggest factor because UCLA just hasn't played in that sort of environment yet. And it certainly helps that they have a fifth year quarterback who has played in a, a bevy of stadiums before worthy of note. He has not played with this UCLA team. It feels like a different one than it was. I, I think he played in 2018, but he's a completely different player now. And he didn't play a couple of years ago in, in, in the COVID season. So he is a really refined, impressive passer. He is a dynamic athlete uh, as we all know. But one thing that, that stood out in last year's game was Kayvon Thibodeau started to kind of enforce his will and take over that offensive line. And it's a good UCLA offensive line. And I've been really encouraged by the progression of the pass rush for Oregon this year. It was one of my biggest concerns for the team coming into this season. And I think Dorless and DJ Johnson have been really good. They've got some sacks each. They also have a lot of pressures and I just watch them and say, yeah, they're, they're thrown off that timing a little bit. I think if Oregon can get DTR uncomfortable, make him uncomfortable and put him in those positions where he's got a guy bearing down on him, he can stand in there and deliver and make throws. But for the most part this year, that UCLA offensive line has held up really, really well. And I think that if the Ducks can get pressure on him, he's going to be much like in that road environment I was talking about in a place where he hasn't been before. And that's a tough thing to adjust to on the fly against a red hot Oregon team. Yeah, and, and I, I was watching the highlights from the last game with DTR, and one thing is really apparent. Not only is he a phenomenal runner, I hate for that the first thing I talk about with him, but he really is. Uh, Lanning was talking about how he moves like a more like a back or a wideout with the ball in his hands when he's you know improvising and, and using his legs. But the other thing that really stood out to me, Spencer, was if you give that guy a clean pocket, he will make you pay, and he yep. will just pick you apart. And I think for Oregon, another unique aspect here is that kind of in a similar way maybe that Bo Nix has been using the pump fake, which has just been beautiful of late. I know we've talked about it a couple times. Um, DTR is a veteran quarterback, and he's going to be able to – he has a good feel for the game. So even if you get hits on him and stuff like that to, to kind of try to rattle him, he, he's not maybe going to be as easy to to rattle or get off his game as some of these other quarterbacks that, that Oregon has faced uh, or that they might face uh, down the road here in, in the Pac-12 uh, slate. But uh, he, he's an absolute, absolutely special talent. And I think for them, one of the things that Casey Rogers was talking about this week was that this defense is going to have to stop the run to, to really set up, you know, their pass rush ultimately. Um, and a lot of that starts, like you mentioned, with, with Brandon Dorless and DJ Johnson getting after the passer. Uh, but Casey Rogers has been one of the guys who I think his stock has really improved throughout the year not necessarily making a ton of highlight plays, but a bunch of those plays on the interior that you kind of take for granted when they're not happening. But, you know, whether it's, you know, commanding the double team or, or shooting the right gap, he's been a super good piece for this uh, defensive front, especially when you consider Popo being out for the year. Uh, could be coming back for, I think, a seventh year is what it was, sixth or seventh year. Still remains to be seen, uh, you know, with him kind of having that uh, me uh, medical deal with his season ending injury. Um, so case in point, I, I, I agree. Oregon's going to have to get some pressure on DTR, but really that, that starts up front with, with stopping Zach Charbonnet in that run game. And man, he, they, they've been phenomenal running the ball as well. So this is a really, really well-rounded offense. That's, that's not going to be easy to scheme up. We know as Oregon fans, Chip wants to run the football and he has a tandem back there in DTR and Zach Charbonnet that are prolific at, at doing just that a year ago, Zach Charbonnet's worst statistical game came against Oregon. And I would argue, Max, and I believe the statistics bear this out, Oregon's run defense this year has been even better than a season ago. And to your point about the pass rush and what uh, I think it was either Riley or, or Rogers mentioned that you take away the run, you get them into obvious passing situations, and that helps your defensive line. Because if you are completely caught off guard all the time about whether or not it's going to be a run play or a pass play, your defensive line has to have that half moment of hesitation, and that's oftentimes the difference between making a play or allowing a gain either through the air or or on the ground. But if they can do what to Zach Charbonnet, what they did a season ago, I would feel really good about the potential for this defense because UCLA's got good weapons. They've got good receivers on the outside, led by Jake Bobo. Aziki, their tight end, has done a nice job filling in for Greg Dulcich. But overall, I don't think the the depth of guys. I mean, Kyle Phillips was really good. They haven't used Casimir Allen a lot. I've been really confused by that. 
he is a prototypical Chip Kelly player with just ridiculous speed, but he's definitely going to be a factor on special teams in Oregon, whose kick coverage has been, I think, a little improved from last year, but still needs to get better. Has to be super disciplined with him because he will take it to the house. You give him a lane, he is the fastest player probably on the field. I don't know if Oregon's got anyone on special teams that that could run with him, at least that's uh, that's healthy and playing and such, like maybe a Kamari Terrell who's got absurd speed and such. But, I mean, for the most part, Kaz Allen is the fastest guy in the field when, when he's there. But switching it back to the defense, if you can take away Charbonnet, I think you, again, put UCLA in a position where they haven't been before, where they don't have as much balance as they want to have. And that's what th- this game is about for Oregon defensively getting UCLA out of rhythm, off their spots, and kind of out of system, to use a volleyball term, of what they want to do with their offense. Yeah, and it, it sets up well for Oregon in, in this matchup, I think, because it's a similar deal with last year, I feel like. Both of these teams were really strong in the trenches. Some of that familiarity that we've discussed before uh, with a guy like Zach Charbonnet in, in particular, Oregon has the best run defense in the Pac-12 right now, even if it is just by a single yard. Uh, I'm looking at the stats right now, 98 rushing yards per game uh, allowed, and then UCLA is right there at number two with 99 yep. rushing yards allowed. So it's going to be a lot of good on good in this game. Um, but Oregon's been battle-tested against some really solid fronts. Obviously, it only gets easier when you start your season with Georgia, which is you know one of those benefits that we kind of see re- recurring throughout this year. You, know, you get your butt handed to you, but uh, you learn from it and uh, grow from it as well. And then they go against the Stanford front. Stanford is really bad, but I feel like they're usually pretty strong and physical and athletic. Um, the Washington State front was pretty solid as well. BYU has some big guys there as well. So uh, Oregon's definitely you know capable and prepared to to slow down the run. But if, if they if they can take that away from UCLA, it's definitely going to make things tough. But if I if I've seen anything from UCLA watching them so far this year, it's that they've done a really good job making the most of their weapons. Uh, I think that Jake Bobo is obviously, you know, they're, they're leading pass catcher right now. They're go-to through the passing attack, but they kind of have some guys a little bit like Oregon in a similar way where, you know, they get a, a catch here and there, uh, you know, some 30, a 35 yard gain or something. Um, so that, that I think really speaks well to their depth that they're able to get big plays out of guys that maybe aren't their main contributors all the time, maybe aren't at the top of the the priority list for, uh, you know, Tosh LePoy, Dan Landing and this defensive staff. So, um, that's just, a, you know, yeah, definitely. You just got to give a nod to, to Chip Kelly and that staff for, uh, the depth that they've been able to build at UCLA and just getting guys ready. Um, especially after you lose guys like Chase Coda and Kyle Phillips, who I really liked watching last year. Um, and Dulcich for that matter, I think he got his first touchdown for the Broncos, uh, last did, week yeah. and, and he was a fun talent to watch. So, um, I mean, UCLA doesn't necessarily have, you know, they're not a, a recruiting powerhouse by any means, but. When you have a really bright offensive mind like Chip Kelly, he, he doesn't need to have these five-star All-American guys to, to make you pay and and to kind of give you some fits. And they've utilized the transfer portal very, very well. Now, DTR was an original UCLA recruit and a highly touted one at that. His development has been quite noticeable in, in the Pac-12 over the last now five seasons. He's the only quarterback that, that Chip Kelly's really had consistently at – at UCLA, I think there were a couple games in 2018 when like Wilton Spate was starting and then he got hurt and then it was just, OK, we're going with DTR and developing him. And they've really been develop- developing him for a season like this, where you have a transfer who came in last year in Zach Charbonnet, who's an NFL running back. You got a transfer in Duke Whiteout, Jake Bobo. You got a couple transfers on defense as well. Byron and Grayson Murphy are uh, a couple of disruptive players at, at the defensive end positions. Then Liatu Latu. I don't know how much you've watched of him, Max. That guy is a force. Six and a half sacks this year, seven tackles for loss. Like he, he's a beast. I've got confidence in Oregon's ability to run the football, and I will tell you why after I remind you this episode brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for football betting info this season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all your sport wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, Go Mariners, as always, MMA, boxing, my personal favorite golf. Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online is where the game starts. The confidence I've got in Oregon's ability to run the football, even though UCLA's 
run defense has been very stout this year. Their competition, I think, is inflating their defensive run numbers a little bit. Now, Utah did not explode. They only put up 25 points as an offense and then had a late pick six when the game was already decided. That's a strong showing for sure. But that's the only time, really, where UCLA has gone up against a team that can go toe-to-toe with them and run the football. And I have the utmost confidence every week, no matter the opponent, in this Oregon offensive line, Max, because I watched them run the football against Georgia and keep Bo Nix upright. And everybody else, I mean, Washington State, I think has a more tenacious and a deeper front seven than than UCLA has. They're, they're comparable for sure, but I think the Cougars have a better defense coordinator and their head coach in, uh, in Jake Dickert than even what UCLA's got in Bill McGovern, who comes down from the NFL ranks. They're much improved. But I still haven't seen a game where they've been totally just just absolutely dominant against the run. And I don't think they've gone up against a team other than Utah, whose offensive line has struggled at times this year. I don't think UCLA has gone up against a team that's capable of running the ball the way that Oregon can. Yeah, no doubt about it. Oregon's run offense has been insane like literally on another level got some notes here fourth fourth in fourth in the fbs by the way i don't know if you had that in there in yards per carry the oregon ducks this year yeah you you took it out of my mouth i'm I'm literally looking at that right now so leads the pac 12 and then fourth in the nation 6.22 yards per carry bo nix bo nix the quarterback 8.28 yards per carry and then bucky irving 7.15 those are tops in the pac 12 those two numbers and I think what, what makes this team even more fun to watch is that we all knew Anthony Brown could run the ball last year, but what couldn't he do so well? And that was pass the ball. Bo Nix can do both, which just really leads this leads this Oregon offense to be very well-rounded um, and, and tough to, to scheme for. So Oregon's running backs have been phenomenal. There, there's hardly any drop-off, if any, between Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington. Jordan James has, has flashed as a, the short down yardage back. Sean Dollars has made the most of his opportunities as well. Uh, and, and like you said, the offensive line has, has been on their level. I think they, I saw the other day that they got uh, added to the Joe Moore yep. uh, mid season award watch list or honor roll, whatever it is for the best offensive line unit in the entire country. And they've done it with a multitude of guys. It's not just the same starting five. Although I will say Oregon fans are probably happy to see, uh, a little bit more consistency from a personnel uh, standpoint than last year. When, when Oregon's offensive line wasn't doing too well last year, they were still rotating in a bunch of guys. And I think that left people wondering, why aren't we striving for some continuity to try to iron that out? But you see guys like Jackson Powers Johnson coming in, Bradley, not Bradley, Dawson Jaramillo, excuse me. He's getting in there as well. Marcus Harper has, has been flourishing in Stephen Jones's absence. Um, not a whole lot of updates there on the injury front, but Lanning said earlier this week that he's been, that Steven Jones has been doing more than he has in the past. Um, so we're still kind of waiting to see if he'll be able to come back this year. Never like to speculate too much on the injury front. Um, but since we're talking about the offensive line, I think it's relevant. So yeah, that offensive line has been uh, as good as you could possibly ask for. I think that that was a priority that was high on Oregon's fans list after having Mario Cristobal and Alex Mirabal here. Um, You know, the offense isn't going to do anything if you can't have a good offensive line. That's where it all starts. And Adrian Clem has, has come in and there hasn't been any drop off there. If anything, it's just excelled even more. And they've kept Bo Nix upright in addition to their strong running statistics. And that's been a big part of Bo Nix being an over 70% completion guy this year. Now, conversely, DTR has got the same sort of feel with his big fellows up front. They're also on that Joe Moore Award watch list. The other Pac-12 team at this point is USC, but UCLA's offensive line has been very good. They run the ball well. They can throw it. They're explosive. They're multiple. They do a lot of things that that Oregon fans probably remember about the Chip Kelly offense from back in the day. But I think this offensive line is, for the Bruins, is, is, a, is a different sort of unit than, than what chip has had in the past you think the old school oregon teams from 2009 to 2012 with chip at the helm the offensive line were they were nimble right they could pull out and get out on the edge and that's what everything was about you'll see a lot more power running from this ucla team but i think that plays into Oregon's strength and utah's front seven is not what it was a year ago oregon's has been really strong this year and if you tell me that that Dorless is out there to make plays, and then you have Noah Sewell and 
Justin Flo healthy, and then you throw guys like Jeffrey Bossa and Keith Brown into the mix, I think you have a front that can go toe to toe with UCLA. And I'm very confident in how Oregon is going to be able to to stop the run, even though that UCLA offensive line is good. I think the question will be, Chip Kelly sees the stats too. Oregon's pass defense, I'm pretty sure is last in the Pac-12 in yards per game allowed right now. He's going to rely on DTR, who's a fifth-year quarterback. He's not going to be shy about letting him throw the ball around. And so I wonder if a guy who typically wants to be 60-40 run the football and Chip Kelly is the play caller, if he will reverse that and say, come and get him, right? Because Oregon's pass rush has been improving. They've gotten a lot better, but I wouldn't say it's the strength of their of, of their defense. Yeah, no, it's it's not right now. And, and I think what Jeffrey Boss is a guy that I've been super high on since last year, and, and he just continues to, to, to evolve his game. I think another guy that maybe deserves a little bit more credit is Keon Ware Hudson in the middle. He, he kind of gets lost in the discussion sometimes. He came up with a fumble recovery against Arizona last week or two weeks ago. Um, but, yeah, you make a good point about the pass defense, how that's definitely been an area where Oregon's been able to be exploited. Um, but, you know, that, that that goes hand in hand with uh, with the pass rush. If they're able to get more pressure, then that takes some off the DBs. We all know that that relationship kind of yin and yang. Um, so, I think the the open field tackling has been really good for Oregon if we're just sticking on the defense for a little bit. Um, I think it's really going to be about limiting the explosive plays uh, with with this UCLA offense and um, just not trying to complicate things too much. You know, it's, there's going to be some gains, but if you got if someone gets a catch, you know, don't don't let them run 10, 15 yards after it. You know, just get them down there right right there at the sticks and then get off the field. I mean, that, that's got to yeah. be something we have to talk about, too, on third down. That's just been something that Oregon has, I wouldn't say completely struggled with because the numbers have gotten a little bit better. But Dan Lanning talked about how that was a focus for both sides of the ball um, during the bye. I think there's there's less room for concern or area for concern, cause for concern on offense uh, with the efficiency that they were operating with against Arizona. But with, with a game like this on the line, you got to you know take what the other team gives you. And if that's an opportunity to get off the field on third down, you got to convert and you got to, you got to get out of there and, and, you know, stop those drives, hold them to a field goal or, or force a punt. And by the way, UCLA best offense in the PAC 12 this season on third down, they convert almost 60%. It is the almost sole reason, at least from a box score standpoint, why they were able to beat Washington. The Huskies couldn't stop them because they couldn't get off the field. And Washington's run defense has been pretty good this year. They, they kept Charbonnet in check for a little while. You know, he didn't go totally crazy. DTR did, had over 300 yards passing in that one. But Washington couldn't get off the field. Oregon definitely going to to need to do that. Last thing we're hitting on the show here today, Max, is a, a mailbag question. Stepping away from this specific UCLA game, but someone wants to know, and I'm curious as to your thoughts. Uh, this question comes via the YouTube comments from someone whose name I cannot repeat here on the show because we are G-rated. So I uh, I imagine you know who you are. Realistically, do you see the Ducks reaching the college football playoffs in the next four to five years? Recruiting looks good, but to compare, compared to some other schools, I feel like Oregon is in the lower upper class, I kind of agree, of the country. It feels like we're right there, but not quite hitting that threshold. Go Ducks, you're the GOAT, Spence. So non-GOAT Max Torres, what uh, what do you say to that question? Yeah, man, this is this is a really interesting one that I feel like it's kind of on the back of my back of my mental, you know, all the time. I just kind of try to use it to see, you know, based on the recruits that Oregon's getting, the coaches that come in, the the trajectory of the program. Um, I, I think I could see it happening, um, especially with the expanded playoff coming. Um, but this was just kind of a big storyline that uh, was really piqued my interest when Lanning was hired because we talked about it the Pac-12 championship is kind of the expectation, if not the bare minimum for, for at least team. Get, getting there. Getting yeah. There. Get, getting there. It, it, but it's, it's tough because, you know, how do you expect that necessarily out of a first year coach, but so far Lanning's doing everything to check those boxes and get them there. So Oregon's championship window is, is a, certainly an interesting topic. Uh, I think the recruiting is, is definitely on that level to get to the playoff, but you mm-hmm. got to keep in mind getting to and winning the playoff are two totally different things. Getting to, winning the playoff game and then winning two playoff games to take home the program's first national championship. Those are just totally different levels. So I think really uh, they're recruiting every position. I would say um, 
ex- at least in the past recently, except for like quarterbacks, the biggest question, like you, you, you've seen Oregon bring in these high level guys at all positions, not to say that Ty Thompson isn't a high level guy, but it, it looks like it's pretty evident right now that, that he's not necessarily the, the clubhouse leader right now. Um, at least not in my eyes uh, for after this year, if, if Bo Nix were to leave. Yeah, no, I'm with you. So but based on how the, the team has managed the quarterback position, I think that it's definitely not where it needs to be to get back to the playoff in comparison to those schools like the Bama's and the Ohio States, the Clemson's, the Georgia's that are getting there every year. I feel like, or not or almost every year. It's just, it's not solidified enough. I think it's moving in the right direction, but um but that's like a, one of the big topics with, you know, transfer quarterbacks and, you know, long-term health of the the program, bringing in high school prep guys and developing them. Uh, that's a whole different discussion. But to answer your question, I think that they can get there in the next four to five years. But for me, I think quarterback, how they recruit and manage that position once said recruits or players get to campus is going to be that that biggest determining factor, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the recruiting at a level, when you look at other teams that have made the playoff in in past years, including the last Pac-12 team to do so in Washington in the 2017-18 season, they certainly are are getting the the talent that that they need. But a lot of things have to come all the way together. But in the next four to five years, I would be pretty disappointed if they didn't get there at least once, if you're talking four to five, if you're talking two to three, that's different because once this team, you know, has a lot of people leave after this year on the offensive line, the defense as well, it won't be, you know, a full reset, but it will be a lot of turnover and change. And you got to have a team that, that kind of builds. Remember the last team to get to the playoff was the second year for Mark Helfrich in the year before, right? Mariota wasn't fully healthy. Maybe that team was good enough to get to the college football playoff. They probably were. But then he came back and then you had a bunch of guys, you had some new recruits come in. Like it takes a full combination of so many factors to get there because it's such a high level. I think I'll explore that more next week on the show because for now we are uh, ready for UCLA. I hope to get to watch as much of it as possible. I'll be uh, peeking at my laptop during the ad breaks on, on Saturday's broadcast in Cedar City where I will be. Max Torres covers the Ducks for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. He also hosts the Ducks Dish podcast. If you want interviews with recruits and all that good stuff, go check him out over there on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Max, excited for the game. Can not wait. And very, very quickly, if you want to, by all means, throw out a prediction. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited for the game, too. Uh, It's going to be a fun one. Definitely wanted to apologize for my lighting today. It's usually not this bad, I swear. Um, I'm I'm kind of uh, stalling so I can look at my prediction that I wrote on my site um, and get it up. But I think uh, the prediction that I rolled out uh, was I said Oregon wins 42 to 34. Um, So I think that this should be a high scoring game. Mm. Um, I have enough confidence in Oregon's defense to come up with some stops and and big plays when they need it. Um, I think that could definitely be the deciding factor here because I don't have a Huge amount of confidence in UCLA's defense. I think the respect more so lies on the offensive side of the ball, and and defense is where Oregon looks more vulnerable right now of the two sides. Um, but like we've talked about, Oregon's at home. It's a huge game. I think it's a close one, but I uh, ultimately think the Ducks get it done. And Duck fans, if you want to hear my prediction, you're just going to have to listen to tomorrow's show. I'll be talking with Zach Anderson, Yaksheimer, the host of Locked On at UCLA. Max, good to talk to you. As always, my man. All right. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Appreciate it. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.